There we go, there we go. solar electric car charging before people were really doing it. <laughs> Is there a reason you have so many ponds? That's trout farm. It's trout farm. And what was it when you arrived? Well, it was an abandoned trout farm, so you had the rock work and the empty ponds and not as much growth but it all burned off in 95. So then there was no growth. And so this has all come back. It was a moonscape here. It was just um, a pretty devastating landscape. This is a picture of the Cuesta Ridge from San Luis Obispo uh, during the fire. Uh, this is a picture of our place we lost uh, our house, our, uh, one of the cars, our pet pig was all, was all gone. So <laughs> it was pretty devastating. Did you have the feeling you were starting from scratch? Well, we had different, her reaction was much different than mine. Mine was sort of the construction and destruction are two sides of the same coin. We had just done first straw mill building in the, in the state that was permitted. And we looked at that and said, wow, that's an interesting thing. Too bad we've done our own place and it's all done. You gotta watch out what you wish for, I guess. And then, so then we got, to, so this is all straw bale, which has advantages in terms of fire. These benches, straw bale benches, were done before the fire and they're the only thing that was left after the fire, which proves a point on that. It's more fire resistant, which is a contradiction of terms, but it's like trying to burn a phone book. So we had a chance to redo everything. So from the crisis came the opportunity, like the yeah. Chinese word, right? Yeah. And we got to do all these buildings and play with them. Well, we'll show you the, the house. It has the straw bales. This is a two-story bale wall. Oh. And, have, and so the bales are just tied in here with these metal plates. Go over. Oh, yeah. And that goes up two stories. So these are the bales, yeah. and this is the structure. Yeah. That's great. So we didn't want to, we, we got tired of hiding this, this beautiful wood inside the bale wall. Right. And then he, it's a pain in the ass to have to Fit, fit the bales between the wood, so why not separate them? And that's a sort of step to the, to the shell. So we should show you the outside of this because you get the feeling of what we can accomplish with workshops. That's another advantage of struggle. Yeah. You can do them with workshops. It's a communal effort, like a barn raising kind of. Yeah. And the nice thing about bale raising or bale workshop, mm -hmm. there's something for everybody. So the super macho, do the throwing the bales up, you know, and catching them up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had kids sewing. We had a group of old people with bad backs. They did this one over here, and I think that's the best. Another advantage of the bales is most stucco buildings are all cracks all over the place. If you notice this wall, there's very little crack. The, the reason is the bale has a nice tooth, and the, the stucco can expand and contract in its own thing, and the bale rides along with it. So you're not fighting each other like a standard thing, so I like this sign. <laughs> we call it the old elephant hide aesthetic. <laughs> That's what the contractor called it. Why? An old elephant hide aesthetic. If you look at elephant hides, you know, you're not trying to make it straight and, and weed whack in it. Most bale buildings, they weed whack it and they get it really crisp looking. Who wants it crisp? For Christ's sake, I mean, oh, I got it fucking crisp. <laughs> right, it's nice that way. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is, it's bales. It's not a, it's not a, a two by four with plywood on each side and, yeah. and drywall. And that aesthetic, I think, I think it's a beautiful wall there. Your home before the fire was what? Just this foundation? What's left of the home from before the fire? Or oh, just the foundation here. Just the foundation. You can see that, yeah. And it has some angles and stuff. Uh -huh. So before the fire, 
This was our house. It had three stories here, metal skin, custom tub. So this is left over. This survived. Yeah. In the tub. So this was a bathtub yeah. or a, a hot tub or? Yeah, a custom made bathtub for two people. So what is left from before the fire? All this concrete wall here? Yeah, the concrete wall and the slab. You see all the scars. What is the shape of your house? I mean, it's a fractal shape. What? <laughs> fractal shape. Is it? Because it's, it's not a square or a rectangle or it's kind of wheels around. <laughs> I'm big on fractals. How do you define fractal architecture? Ah, well, you're looking at instead of a Euclidean look with three dimensions and stuff, you look at multiple dimensions, infinite number of dimensions between the things and much more complexity. We're trying to say that all this wiggly squiggly stuff is, is fractal stuff. More and more difficult for a building. Well, it's Well, it's more difficult for building right now because everybody's in the Euclidean thinking. There's something just very pleasing about, I guess, what you would call the fractal architecture, yeah. not having a being inside a box. Yeah. Like you see it here with the lines and the light and the, it feels good. So I had all these, all these craftsmen work, uh, working on this stuff. And one guy is a carpenter, standard carpenter says, God damn it. Everybody's having so much fun here. And I, I'm not, you're making me do the straight stuff. We said, take that sofa and do something with the sofa for us. And he did that sofa. I think it's one of the nicest pieces here. It's a beautiful sofa. Yeah. Okay. We were fortunate in having this beautiful wood because of the fire. <laughs> oh, wait, all this is firewood. Yes. yes. Okay, and the ceiling here it. is cold pines. It's not very strong, but it has a nice pattern. That? That's the ceiling here. Oh, the ceiling here. Oh. So see, each wood, each wood has its own nature. This is the sixth pond and the seventh pond. Mm -hmm. And then the Sergeant yeah. Cypress forest starts here. And if you look carefully, you can see stumps within that grove. And those are ones that we cut down and milled. We realized that all these big stumps of Sergeant Cypress trees that had died in the fire were like kiln drying on the hoof and that they actually had another life. And we were able to find somebody who would come in and help us cut the trees down. And then we found some young men that had a mobile mill and they came and helped us mill those logs to be able to rebuild our house and office with. So this little structure here using wood that was too wiggly for the house and I built this little garden shed. It's crucially important to know where south is. Most of our windows are facing south. The other key to that is the wing walls. That shades in the morning, early morning and afternoon in the summertime. Another aspect of this south facade is that not all the windows go all the way to the inside. We have several water wall and trom wall, they're called. Um, the water walls are these low on either end. Those lower windows go into tanks of water for w warming. There's water inside this? Yeah, let's show you. Inside. You can see better, okay. So in the winter time, the sun's low, heats the water, radiates to the inside. No moving parts. So you don't see on the inside. On the outside, do you see anything? You, well, you, you see in a mass of cobwebs between the glass and the thing, because spiders can get but in it's anything. A, it's a tank. Yeah, it's a tank and the glass. How do you call this system? Is it Trom water? Uh, we call it Bainbridge wall. He's the first one that did this. At the time, he's a graduate student at Davis. So basically, w w what's happening? Oh, okay. The sun's coming in, and we got a selective surface on the face of the wall. Yes. In other words, black, really black. Yeah. And then it, it's warming the water, and then the water's radiating. So then you go from short wave radiation to long wave radiation, which is radiating to the interior. So it's over time, yeah. it's going to release and nine inches of thickness is timed with computer analysis and that nine inches is just right. For the capacity of the water, water for balancing day, for out how much radiation you're getting in from the sun in the winter. And if it's a masonry wall, we'd be 12 inches. So that's what those, those are. Yeah, this is the trauma wall here. 
In the masonry walls, the trauma wall parts are, are deeper because masonry acts different from water. Water's, water's the most efficient, actually. It's, well, if everybody only knew. <laughs> but there's very few of these water walls. It stores so much more heat. So you have thermal mass and also the effect of the sun. And, insula and super insulation. And super insulation. From the straw bales. And then these are all straw bales you see on. So the bales go from here all the way around. But for passage solar, we want mass on the inside and insulation on the outside. It's the opposite of the standard construction because you want to hold the heat and it cools. So six inches of water tank, 12 inches of trombone, or stucco on the bales for holding heat there. So we got distributed mass on the balls, water mass and masonry mass, and the masonry mass of the shear wall here, which is the earthquake resistant interior. All these bales went in in a weekend. So, Why so fast? It's, well, they're big <laughs> and everybody gets excited and you can't stop them. Yeah, we built a little cottage right away to be able to move back here as soon as we could. Uh, yeah. With telephone poles. Wow. And a straw bale, even in the ceiling. And the only truth window in the office is right there. Uh, Opening so that we could check the moisture. Check the yeah. moisture of the bales. Because the bales get too, too moist, they start rotting out. Okay. So being dry is real important. And keep For it dry, side. that's why the overhangs. Are. Besides the sun overhang thing, okay. it's also the rain. But you also don't want to seal the wall. And that was the early, all the building officials wanted to put a vapor barrier on the outside. Well, then the wall can't breathe and it rots out too. So you got a breathing wall, vapor barrier can work its way out. I mean, the water vapor and so forth. Here's the Sarge of Cypress. All that wood is, the thing sticking out there, yeah. And the cabinets are all older. That was firewood? Well, that's, yeah, yeah. That looks so well, see, it, perfect. It just, it just cooks the outside. I mean, it crisps the edges, but the wood is great. Oh, it does and it's kind of, I got a half killed dry already. So all this furniture came from burnt wood? Yeah, all the wood in here. Oh, this is an antique, antique space. This is the classic library before Google. <sighs> So you got all this shit to Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Obsolete. We, What's up there? What's above us? Oh, okay. So the thermal mass economically was the weak link. And so we thought we'd experiment a little bit. The Germans make this thing called Micronol, mm -hmm. which is a little bottles of paraffin at a nanotechnology scale. You can't see them. They're so small. And we cast them into these tiles. They're six times as effective as a brick. And then we put those in this dishes so the sun in the winter time is hitting them and they're supposed to radiate to the interior. So it was an attempt to try to get better thermal mass. And, uh, Did it work? Well, not as much as we hoped because there's too many windows here. <laughs> uh, okay. we, we, we loved windows and views outside. There's a door. So we, this, this room was sort of more to hold the pho photovoltaic panels that we have up there than You have a book called Fractal Architecture. Architecture, yeah. What's that? The best example, I took different societies. These are classic societies, the way they think of space. Here's the Japanese the meditation garden. It's layered, indirect, blah, blah, blah. The French, or the thing with the axial things. The Islamic with, with the separation of exterior space, interior space. It's Hindu. But if you look at this African thing, this is a... Yeah. It, it is a fractal because it's, it's a corral based on cattle. Anyway, anyway yeah, so there's a lot of stuff in here. That... So you're kind of hoping for more of a revolution in how we see space in yeah, yeah, architecture, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. just using materials like straw bale, but you think there could be a big change in even how we shape our homes. Yeah, it's going to take all that. This is the dog's, oh, dog's, yeah, dog's domain. <laughs> And that's our, yeah. so it has the uh, straw bales on that side there. It has the water tanks. Oh, we should show them how this works here. Yeah. 
Go right ahead. Oh, okay. All right, so we got this just standard roof. If you get a really cold day in the late spring, this thing opens up and it's automatic. It has a Freon tube and another one. And so in the morning, it's like that. And then the sun hits the other tube, where you see the bolts too, and boils the material to that one and it opens. And at night, it goes the opposite and it closes. Yeah. We have the same water wall kind of. That's water. That's yeah. the water. So there, and there's no way of getting in there. I mean, if you needed to. No, it's well, just, if it leaks, then you'd have to fix it, but it hasn't, it hasn't leaked. We've been doing these for 20 years for ourselves and for clients. Never a leak. Sometimes they're made with the top openable and you can get to it, but if you just leave a little gap so that the water can expand when it warms, there's no air in the water. There's no okay. oxygen, so it doesn't rust. Okay. So basically that water is heating up and then radiating the heat during the night. Yes. Right. And the water can hold more heat than air. Yeah. Twice that, of, twice that of me. Twice that of air. This was an attempt to create a load-bearing straw bell wall. This wall is essentially load-bearing, and it's like a shell. It's a curved surface, and that gives you much more structure. Really? So it's better? Like a shell, yeah. Yeah, it's much better enough, that wall. There's no structure in that other than the bales. So this is a shop, and it's a mess, like shops are. Okay. <laughs> So all this wood here is, is all of the milled wood. But this was the wood that was too rough for the house. It's kind of the scrap from the lumbering operation after we've done the house. This is leftover stuff. Okay. This was the last building. Yeah, I've drunk a lot of instant espresso. <laughs> Over 50 years we've been doing this stuff, you get a lot of coffee bottles. Yeah. So you, you lay the bales. And then you put this on the outside and this on the inside, and you take a, a needle, these medieval looking <laughs> yes. things here, through and take a wire through and tie them real tight. So a sandwich, bale sandwich, and then just stucco, let the and stucco becomes a shell. So it almost makes a block. Yeah, well, well, but it's a warped surface. That's the key is warping the surface to, to not have. And then, then the, the conservative straw bale people say, oh yeah, but it's gonna settle differentially. So what? You know, that end settles 10 inches more down than this end. Can anybody tell once it's done except me? No. Most people are very conservative. They want the bales straight and smooth, but we just like to see the bales wheel around. <laughs> if you notice, no exposed wood on the outside. Now all that colored metal, that's off our other house. That burnt. Yeah, this is all. This is all, uh, we had so much of this metal because the other house was three stories. And it was made of metal. It was a it metal was skinned, house? It was, no, it was supposed to be a house, but it was c covered with metal because we knew about the fire problem. Okay. But metal and, is, is better than wood, but not, not as good as straw bale with, with straw bale. You get a two hour fire rating. So what do you expect if a fire happened? What would happen here? You, do you expect the fire to... Oh, it's gonna be a fire. I, you know, California by nat nature burns off every 40, 50 years. And we're kind of getting set up for the next cycle here. And what, of course, we have to do is what the, in, the indigenous people did all over the country for the United States, control burn every so often, do a light controlled burn. But we're not into that because we're scared of fire. So, for example, that the bush behind you there, the Ceanothus, see it's dying. They have a certain lifespan and then they die and they're replaced by oak trees that's coming up under it. That's just a natural process. And then those things are sitting there like a torch, you know, they're, they're drying out and getting ready to... One more year on that and then we're going to cut it. Every year we do a ton of dead stuff and get it out of here because otherwise the fire becomes catastrophic. Like the last one, the California, well they call it forestry people, claimed that this was the, the heat release right here was equivalent of two Hiroshima bombs an hour. So those fires are really uh, intense. And it's a natural part of the process. If, if you don't let it burn regularly, you hold it back, hold it back till all the stuff builds up, then it really goes. It's really catastrophic.
<laughs> so charred. That's from fire. The hotter parts die and the other stuff's growing back around it now. So oaks are very resilient. Oh yeah. So here's the date of all this stuff. So here's the chop farm formed and the guy planted all these trees, planted these redwoods. This one died just last year. And then the fire comes in. You get this, this thing. Oh, scarring maybe from the... Yeah, from that's the what I think. Yeah. And then right after the fire, we got a really wet period. So you see the uh, rings are going da da da. Then it's really light. Then the fire comes in and then you look at it, you get some very thick ones. Uh, so here's the guy that started all this stuff. And he did all the ponds, he did all the stonework. And wow. you see, when we, when we came, first came here, all this was, the, the rocks were here and the ponds were here, but there was no water. It's an old trout farm that we've brought back to life, except we've converted it instead of trout to endangered species. <laughs> Maybe we'll run into some red-legged frogs. They like to hang out in the weirs during the day. At night, they'll be all over the place. Oh, really? Well, I don't see any here. This was all bare around the edge. And so the weeds brought all this vegetation out of the creeks and stuff and established this, it's kind of a natural swimming pool, I guess you could call it. Yeah, they're not cooperating today. Not. Oh, there's a turtle. Ooh. Yeah. But that's the Southwest pond turtle, which is another endangered species here. Water management, forest management, Fire management. Ah, you got it, yeah. You've been dealing with, with a lot of things that are becoming more and more prescient and important. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is it pays us because we get the wood and we get to ch chase red-legged frogs, <laughs> bullfrogs. <laughs> okay.